Hello, everyone. Dr. Stillman here with Brian Richards. We are here today to talk about the magic of sauna. Uh, I'm sitting in front of my sauna space photon, and Brian is in his factory, which is 100 and something degrees because the air conditioning is broken. Brian, thank you for joining me today. I'm so happy to be here, Leland. Thank you for having me. Cool, man. Your audio is a little bit, a little bit low. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you great. Okay, great. Awesome. So, you know, the first question I wanted to ask you is how did you get into building saunas? Yeah, it, my, my history, Leland, is is uh, all about solving my own personal problems. So, sauna space is 10 years old. And I went through my initial health journey a couple years before that. I I had a, an array of symptoms that I would call adrenal fatigue. So I had mm -hmm. insomnia and mind racing. Um, mm -hmm. I was lethargic, kind of low energy, mm -hmm. and also as irascible. I had sort of an impatience about me, a little bit of negativity maybe. And mm -hmm. I wasn't happy with the situation, but I also wasn't happy with what was being recommended to me by conventional medicine. I even got uh, recommended to take Accutane for, for acne. I had acne on my torso, kind of only on my back where my kidneys were, which now makes a lot of um, sense because those are, those are toxin filters. Hmm. So uh, that was a bit of a shock moment for me. I didn't want to take any drugs and Accutane certainly has a lot of side effects. So I was thinking, what can I do that's more addressing of the root causes of things? So I got online dissatisfied and, and did my own research, trying to figure out my own health uh, solution. And in that research, I came across sauna. I kept coming across sauna, both from the ancestral perspective, every human culture on earth has some kind of sauna sweat lodge tradition, mm -hmm. but then also the modern research uh, marries really well with that ancestral wisdom. Sauna is used for longevity and reducing dimension. A lot of the things that we'll talk about. So, but primarily this idea that, Hey, maybe the contributing factor to, to disease, one of the most important ones is toxicity and poisons in the body. And through purification of the body, will the cells, will the organs, will the body work better? So this intrigued me. And then at the end of my research, I found Dr. Kellogg's electric light bath, which every time I think about it, it gives me a tingle. Um, hmm. So the world's first electric sauna is not the standard far infrared sauna that most people are familiar with. Right. It's the electric light bath. So incandescent light bulbs were invented in 1887. And then um, in 1891, Dr. Kellogg. So Dr. Kellogg is the brother of the guy that invented Kellogg's cornflakes, which is, uh, we have to mention that. That's an interesting side note. So in the early 20th century, out of control male libido was considered a societal problem. And so cornflakes were invented to to address that <laughs> uh, yeah, the turntables have turned <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and it worked oh, wow so so his brother had was a a doctor who treated patients at a sanitarium which is a, a anachronistic word for a spa or like a clinic in well, battle creek michigan where you treated people with tuberculosis because tuberculosis was one of the only diseases well only it was one of the major diseases that they had trouble treating historically, particularly in the pre-antibiotic era. Yeah. So, so he had a, definitely infectious disease patients, but he had really chronic disease patients of all kinds. So, uh, four or five years after light bulbs invented, this guy says, Hey, these are really cool. Let's use them to power a sauna. He invents this Victorian style cabinet with an array of incandescent light bulbs in it. And he then proceeds to log over 200,000 sauna sessions with over 50,000 chronically ill patients. And he developed mm -hmm. uh, a, a really amazing array of protocols or an amazing array of outcomes and also some specific protocols and treatment of so many diseases. And he wrote a book about this called Light Therapeutics, published in 1910. You can read this online. So I, I found this, this uh, treatise and I was like, whoa, this is so interesting. And and it's also not a sauna type that you really see. So I uh, found a modern doctor's rendition of this, built my own and used it right before bed. And, and guess what? I slept well. So I was like, huh? And so I used it again before bed and I slept even better. And I, I consider my insomnia issues to have gone away like that quickly. Mm -hmm. So that gave me the impetus to really use the product with discipline for a uh, half a year, after which I 
was able to look back and, and realize that, oh, I had like I, adrenal fatigue. You know, when you have brain fog, you're not necessarily even aware of it. And when you're in the funk, you know, and you have the, the negativity or, or whatever, just the bad mood, you know, I wasn't really self-aware. But once I cleaned my, cleaned my car, so to speak, you could see any mud that you throw on the car. So I looked back and realized, wow, not only did my acne and my sleep improve, all these other health issues that I had, I wasn't even aware of also resolved, also got better. I had a lot more patience and energy and more positivity and really energy levels, like getting through a long day. I have, you know, still a company now 10 years later, and it's a lot of work and long days sometimes. And the, the electric light bath has really been my salvation in making sure my brain works right and my body works right. Uh, each day and and keeping me healthy. So that that was the inspiration. And it, because I looked around, I noticed that no one else was offering this. This technology wasn't like made available as a commercial product. And I found it. I, I basically made a few and this and that, and then eventually founded Sauna Space with a couple hundred bucks. And and that was ten years ago. Uh, two or three business loans later, and a couple of almost bankruptcies as well. You know, here we are. Uh, so the, the company's larger now. I, I'm actually in, if you look behind me, I'm in the factory right now. And now it's the, the shift's over, so nobody's here. But this is all handmade in Columbia, Missouri. And in the beginning, of course, I was making all of them. But I, I basically poured my heart and soul and some tears were involved in, in an obsession into making one thing perfect. And that's uh, you know a modern electric light sauna. That is such a good story. So, you know, it's funny to me is that you said this pr product or technology was not available. And one of the reasons why I like the sauna space, as opposed to some of my other options for not only sauna, but light therapy. And I'm not saying there's not a place for these other, other modalities, right? Because there's lots of frequencies of light, but the sauna space is amazing because not only is it a fantastic sauna that will make you sweat bullets. Um, but you're not just getting the infrared, you're getting the uh, visible light. Talk about how you created the bulbs and what your thinking was and is on what frequencies are most important for people to be getting in their light therapy. Yeah, that's a great question, Leland. So the, the model for me is nature. And the only, um, you know, the, the predominant source of light in nature is the sun more than anything. And the sun is an incandescent light source. So incandescence is in nature when we heat a material up really hot, it emits light naturally mm -hmm. in a very, in, a, in actually a very predictable pattern. So um, full spectrum light, AKA sunlight is incandescent light where we have a, 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 a an emission of all the wavelengths, but it's a big bell curve from the sun that centers on visible light. And within that broad spectrum emission, um, the sun's, so if we look at the sun spectrum and you can see this on my website, sauna.space under the learn section, the sun spectrum is about 43% near infrared, but be due to the deep, deep tissue penetration of near infrared. If we look at the photons per second experienced, another way to say that is the power of the sun that we absorb over 70% of it is near infrared. So that's, that's really interesting. So our ancestral experience with light is predominantly an experience with near infrared wavelengths. Also the wavelengths that penetrate deepest into the body. Also the wavelengths that stimulate mitochondrial response, what people more commonly know as red light therapy. Mm. And then also, um, because of this deep penetration, we have a, a radiant means of heating the body. So yeah, there it is. If you scroll up a little bit, you can see the sun right there. So I've highlighted the near infrared band that I'm, I'm emphasizing, but the sun emits all of those wavelengths in that, in that really broad curve. So uh, there's actually way more near infrared than there is UV or blue. And Which because, is something that a lot of people don't realize. Yeah, there's a lot of emphasis on on vitamin D production from UV from certain types of UV. Right. And that that is a benefit of the body that if you look at, uh, you know, from an uh, evolutionary perspective is an evolutionary adaptation, but as the sun's killing, but, but the sun's killing you at the same time with ultraviolet light because it's ionizing. Mm -hmm. 
So what well, get, stress, but yes. What most people don't appreciate is that the vast majority of the sun's emission is in this healing band called near infrared. So as the sun mm -hmm. is perhaps damaging you to some degree with ultraviolet light, it has way more power that's healing you. There's way more healing power than there is this ultraviolet light and this blue light stuff. And, and so that's, that's nature's model. Nature's model is an incandescent light model. So I worked about four years actually on improving the original incandescent heat lamp that, that really Dr. Kellogg and, and was using and, and it's a hundred year old, 130 year old technology where I, I, I basically tune the filament to make it run hotter. So it shifts that spectrum. You make your own filaments. Yeah, we make our own light bulbs, uh, definitely. And, and the filament is, is sort of the magic. The rest of the light bulb is just handmade and, um, and beautiful because it's, it's mouth blown and hand rolled and it's stained glass rather than painted glass. I didn't even, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We make our own. Well, we're trying to make this purpose driven design here. So making the best of the best. So, so after many years of testing, I figured out a way to redesign the filament so that this peak of the spectrum you see in front of you on the screen shifts into higher frequency so that the portion highlighted in orange here near infrared is greater. So it, it, our thermal light bulb emits two to four times the light therapy irradiance of a standard heat lamp. And it also emits more in the optimal heat therapy band. So more light therapy and more uh, radiant heating power than a regular heat lamp. So, um, so, so basically th that's, that's the idea here is for, in terms of what's the right light to use to heat the body and what's the right light to use to provoke all these benefits of red light near infrared light therapy, also called photobiomodulation. Yeah. I have to say, um, uh, I have to warn people, you may get addicted to your sauna space. You may find yourself in the middle of the afternoon thinking I could be doing something else right now, but I really just want to take a sauna. Yeah, so. it, it really is. And, and it's that feeling that's mm -hmm. different. And that the reason that feeling is different is, is, is not just because of the heat, because all heat feels good. Humans love to be warmed up, but it's perhaps more so the use of near infrared light to do the light therapy benefit. Because when we use near infrared light in the light therapy bracket there, we're, uh, if we do that in the brain cells, we stimulate a lot of things that make us feel better, like dopamine and serotonin release and other things that when our nerve cells in our brain and our central nervous system are nourished and, and the internal organs of the body are nourished with near infrared light and there's mitochondrial response there, uh, we get an improvement in, in the feeling and the experience It all just, it's amazing. It feels better. And if we're talking about penetration, only near infrared light penetrates bone tissue. So if we're using a red light therapy head cap or something like that, it's not penetrating the bone at all. It's only stimulating the skin and, and, the, and the bone itself. To get into the brain, we have to use near infrared, which is what the sun does and what my lamp does. So when you sit inside a sauna space, you get this deep cellular photobiomodulation that results in a sauna experience that's not so much fatiguing and and uh and draining but more rejuvenating more zen more wow this feels good this is this is why i love sitting in front of the fire this is why you know i love being out in the sun it's this feeling absolutely so you mentioned that this was one of this was a game changer for you but did you have to do anything else in order to get your health back on track yes absolutely so i stopped eating most flour type stuff mm -hmm. uh still eat some now that I've corrected, but I went to a more natural food diet, I avoided any kind of processed foods. And I also started doing some body work like yoga, uh, yeah. Yangar yoga actually. So I was just kind of assuming that I'm young and I can just kind of do whatever, but the combination of, of body work, uh, changing to more of a natural diet, the sauna and, uh, uh slowly, not the beginning, but slowly, but surely a uh, more of a focus on meditative practice and a mindfulness practice those things were really like the were my magic sauce to fix myself so you didn't have to take any supplements do any kind of crazy protocols just some basic elimination diet sauna that was it 
Yeah. In the beginning, I didn't take any supplements. I was actually opposed to it. Uh, nowadays, I do take some supplements, uh, mm -hmm. definitely and some that I'm actually a big fan of now. But the, the basic change for me of purifying the body and understanding that, that we eat light, that we eat light, not just for energy, but for healing and nourishment was uh, the most powerful changer, you know, evoked the most powerful change in my health. And really, it's very interesting. Humans are designed to get, uh, there's some argue that uh, humans are designed to get a majority of our energy from the sun. Mm -hmm. Of course, very challenging nowadays with the modern, you know, occidental lifestyle, but it, it's, it really does fuel you. So it's food. Well, that's the thing that, uh, most people are still not up on about how light affects the cell. And I mean, the, the, to, to me, sauna, you, you talk to people about sauna and I had a friend who was going to start a company called third kidney where he wanted to use saunas in order to, um, treat kidney diseases and kidney, uh, failure. Because if you, if you cause someone to sweat, they will actually excrete all the same toxins through their skin that they would excrete through their kidneys. So you, they call it in the literature, the third kidney. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. The, the, so the skin is. The skin is not just to cool us down when we sweat. It's definitely a purifier. Right. It's a detoxifier, but it's not operating all the time like the kidneys and the liver. It's that's it. It's only when we sweat. So if we don't routinely sweat and also sweat passively, as in a sauna or being still, uh, we're not doing a whole lot of detoxification. We're doing some, but that's an important thing to clarify, Leland. There's a big difference between the toxin concentration of sauna sweat versus exercise sweat and it has to do with the state that the nervous system is in so when we're and, and overall the the overall concept of exercise so when we're exercising we're engaging in locomotion the body's producing a lot of energy but all of the energy is going to all the blood flow is going to basically the heart and the lungs and the muscles and mm. all the cellular energy is going towards you know promoting locomotion basically when we're sitting in the sauna, the sauna can be considered to be like up to a hundred kilowatt workout in terms of the energy uh, expended and, and generated in the cell, but we're not moving. So what are the cells doing? The cells are understanding, wow, I can use this extra energy now to heal and to rejuvenate and repair proteins and, and of course, detoxify. So when we look at toxin concentrations of sweat, like if you look at the 9-11, the 9-11 worker sauna studies. Um, mm. There's a couple of good ones out there where they, those guys were exposed to a lot of toluene and all kinds of chemicals from the, the fallout of that event. And they did sauna like once a day for six months and their, their levels of xylene, toluene and other synthetic chemicals dropped dramatically. And the, and the toxin concentration, the sweat was really high. And in contrast, if you look up, like there's a National Geographic article, I don't know if it's still up there, where it was trying to uh, poo the the value of sauna to detox. And they presented the toxin concentration of someone running on a treadmill as the example that there's not much toxin concentration in sweat. Well, there's not when you exercise, but when you're in the sauna, there is. That's why every human culture has been doing this for a long time. That's fascinating. I actually did not know that they had done those studies. Um, what I was going to talk about briefly was uh, because this is the biggest thing that I see people not understanding about light is that as you were saying is you eat light, that light red and infrared in particular helps to build the cellular battery in the mitochondria or the water around the mitochondria in your cells. And people have this idea that it's just illumination and that they get their energy from food. But that's part of why I'm not surprised that you were covered just by using sauna therapy and I'm sure, you know, all the other things that you mentioned, but because, and people are, I think are, are very confused by how say you can improve someone's health without fixing a nutritional deficiency that you know, we often see. And that's very much talked about in the functional and integrative medicine space. But what they don't realize is if you improve the cellular battery and you improve the function of the organism overall, you're going to lose fewer nutrients that you're short on. 
and you're going to better excrete toxins that are interfering with and increasing your need for nutrients. And then you're going to augment normal processes like sleep. You know, you take somebody who's not sleeping at all and get them to sleep just six hours a night and you've completely changed their nutrient balance just by changing uh, their stress levels and their circadian rhythms and you know how their body is functioning. Mm. So it's, it's part of why when people come to me asking for just diet and uh, just supplements, or they are very focused on lab work and there's not an engagement with the lifestyle component, which includes sauna. And there are plenty of people who come to me who don't have a sauna what they don't seem to, I, I think what, what they often don't realize is just how valuable the sauna is. Like for a long time, I, I, I kicked the can of, of having a sauna down the road. I had other things I wanted to buy, other things I wanted to do. Uh, but then finally I bought a sauna space. Part of why I bought it was because it was a small footprint. So it was going to work. It was portable. I really like that. It's very easy to pack this thing up uh, and take it away with you when you move, which is very common for uh, for people today. I mean, Americans have always been a very mobile population, but I think now more than ever with the digital nomad thing, whatever you want to call that, people are like living in Airbnbs and things like that. So um, I finally bought it and I, I was just amazed by how much better I felt, even though I had already before then been spending time outside in the hot Florida sun, uh, you know, and, and getting plenty of time outside and, and breaking a sweat on a regular basis, but the amount of sweat that I, uh, the amount that I sweat in the sauna space just doesn't compare. Uh, it's so much more than I would be losing outside unless I were doing heavy manual labor, but you know, I don't do heavy manual labor outside. And as you just mentioned, I, I didn't know there's a big difference in your sweat concentrations of toxins, uh, when you're, uh, uh -huh. it, when you're in the sauna versus exercising. Yeah, it's that it's that toxin concentration, but it's also the degree of sweating that you mentioned that is really a big difference. So when we look at sauna studies, uh, I mentioned that briefly before. So sauna extends your health span. It extends the years of your life during which you're healthy. And it does that by reducing your risk of dying of all things, all cause mortality. It also reduces your risk of dementia. But but like, what does that mean in terms of a sauna session? How am I achieving that. So if you look at the studies, the sw there are two outcomes that can be measured that qual that make a sauna session qualify as a proper session. And one is sweat loss. So one to two pounds of water lost as sweat was the, the bar for um, the long term cohort studies in Finland, um, where they hmm. did like 20, 25 year studies. So that's a kilogram of water. So I'm usually going in there for about a pound of water and you can measure yourself on a scale before and after right. you know that a pound of water is a fair amount. Um, and, uh, and, and so, uh, that's one way to measure it. And then the other thing to measure is core temperature increase. So if we're sweating a little bit, we've had maybe one, maybe two degrees core temperature increase, but once we hit three degree core temperature increase for a period of minutes, we substantially activate heat shock protein production in the cell. And it's the heat shock proteins that are doing the detox and they're doing the protein repair and protein refolding, the rejuvenation aspect of, of sauna. So we have to sustain, uh, we, we have to have sustained heating stimulus for a while. And of course, these two outcomes can be measured with a scale and with a thermometer. But when you're hitting those, what's happening in the body is We've got a large temperature increase. We've got a, a large, substantial heat shock protein response in all the cells of the body, and we're achieving the outcome of sauna. So we can do that with any sauna, and you could do it even with like a hot tub or other things too. It's just with the sauna space approach, using ink and using near infrared light predominantly, we do that much faster, and you know we don't have to like preheat the sauna or uh, or wait a long time. The sessions are also shorter. How long does it take for that core body temperature to rise? I mean, I know it must depend on the person, but generally speaking. Uh, for me, if I use a four bulb sauna space, it's, I hit about a three degree temperature increase in about 18 minutes, maybe How 20 minutes. That? Um, I, they have these, this is, you know, the, uh, 
there's there's more precise ways to measure, but I'm using those. They have these modern infrared thermometers mm -hmm. that are instant read, and you can measure the forehead. You can measure the the armpit or other areas. I'm usually measuring the armpit or, or something like that. And there's definitely a degree of variance. And also, when you face the sauna, the front of the body is getting heated up first, and then when you rotate, you know, there's a there's a temperature differential of sorts in the body from one side to the other, but uh, any old uh, uh, instant read thermometer will give you an indication and you're just measuring off your baseline. So even though it's not perfectly accurate, you can get a sense of it and you can correlate it with your actual feeling, which I think is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And then you, you also with the sweating, you, you know, looking down at yourself, you know, when I have I sweat out about a pound of water and. Yeah. My, my litmus test is, am I uncomfortably hot? Almost so uncomfortable that I want to, uh, get out and then i usually either back away from the lights or i rotate oh so. and i should mention that i'm glad you brought that up so the other there is one more outcome that was associated with a proper sauna session in the the long-term studies so temperature core temperature increase sweating out a pound of water and also reaching a state of subjective exhaustion which is what you just referred to so that's really funny when, when you when you reach that, what's happening actually in the body, amongst other things, is same thing with exercise. When you feel really uncomfortable and you're trying to push through to the end, you get a, a large production of dynorphins. And the, the dynorphins are these things that make you feel uncomfortable, right? And the amount of dynorphins you produce is correlated with the amount of uh, endorphins that are produced after the workout or after the sauna. So the more you get uncomfortable in there and you can withstand it within the, the bars of safety, the better you feel afterward. Uh, that is fascinating. I don't think I knew what are dynorphins. Uh, it, it's, I think it's a, it's a, it's a molecule that like endorphins, it, it, it does the opposite of endorphins. So endorphins make you feel, give you that, that high, you know, after you've worked out, after you've, exerted a lot of physical effort. So the dynorphins cause you to feel uncomfortable. That's fascinating. It's very rare for anyone to use a word like that, that I'm not familiar with. <laughs> You're welcome, Leland. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, let's see. This is an interesting question. So Sharon asks, is the IR higher dose sauna blanket sufficient? I don't think I sweat a pound after an hour in it. So one of the things that, you know, we've seen rolled out in the last few years has been sauna blankets. Uh -huh. And I have not tried any of these for the record. And I'm going to tell people why. I looked at the blankets and I thought, first of all, I cannot imagine being really hot inside of a giant, basically, bag. I don't think, I mean, I can't think of anything that would be more unpleasant than that. And if you're going to sweat, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble, like, getting this thought out because it's so funny to me. I mean, can you imagine having a pound of sweat in a bag with you? <laughs> it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound fun. It sounds so disgusting. So I never wanted to try them. And then I also was thinking to myself, for many of my patients, the most important organ we're trying to rehabilitate is their head. And by head, I mean their brain, right? But maybe they have a headache or they have TMJ or something, right? So the last thing I want to have poking out of the sauna is their head. Can you make somebody sweat bullets in another type of sauna where your head pops out or whatever? Sure, you can. But the great thing about the sauna space, and I looked at the pop-up saunas that come up to about here. I have a couple people I know who've had those. Uh -huh. Is that they, their head would pop out. Um, but I thought, you know, if you just extend it two or three feet up, it's going to encapsulate the whole body. Why wouldn't you just do that? So, you know, I bought the sauna space and haven't looked back. And there's absolutely no other product that I recommend for this because I just see it working so well. Why would I recommend anything else? Um, and I've tried a lot of saunas. I mean, I remember going to a sauna showroom with that friend I mentioned earlier and we tried, you know, infrared this, and he had a traditional finish sauna. And the, the degree to which you can get hot with a traditional finish sauna, I really like. There's something about the, the um, experience of putting the water on the rocks and things like that, but it's okay. not convenient. I mean, using a traditional finished sauna is a, is a involved, particularly if it's truly traditional and you're actually 
um, starting a fire. You have to start the fire and you have to wait for the fire to heat the rocks. Then you have to get in, you have to put the water on the rocks, then you have to get out and you have to maintain the sauna at the same time. Great thing about my sauna space is I just jump in, hit the light bulbs and it is hot within 60 seconds and I'm sweating in two or three minutes. So um, this question from C. Mislick is interesting. In regards to losing one pound of water as a practitioner, how are you assessing what the appropriate amount is for your patients, Dr. Stillman, especially when a patient is in recovery? So this is something that I don't, I don't actually reach for sauna right away. Uh, it's not that I don't love it and use it all the time, but one of the things I've found is that when you're working with people, a lot of people end up assuming that the patient has enough minerals in their body and in their diet in order to um, be well, right? And with, with sauna, you're going to be losing a certain amount of minerals. What I found working with lots of people is that I needed to get them eating a mineral dense diet, generally speaking, right away. This means a certain proportion of nuts and seeds, things like green leafy vegetables, plenty of salt. I start people at about a teaspoon of salt so long as they have no issue with that much salt. I want people eating a high potassium diet in most cases. So once we have all that in place, then they're going to have the minerals they need in order to actually deal with the sauna. I've seen excessive sauna um, trigger like fasciculations and muscle twitchiness and irritability and fatigue. That's in the extreme cases. And it's always in a, in a case where someone's either not eating enough minerals and specifically salt and really the four macro minerals that I look at in my hair tissue mineral analysis. I'm going to be having a webinar with Clark Engelbert about hair tissue mineral analysis. He actually emailed me about this, Brian. He said, by, by the way, tell Brian that I see enormous heavy metal uh, detoxification in the hair when I uh, am testing the hair. He tests hair tissue mineral analysis and he sees huge quantities of heavy metals coming out in people who are using your products. It's part of how he yeah. knows they yeah. work really well. Yeah. And so um, you got to get people eating a mineral dense diet. Otherwise, they're not going to do well. Uh, and there's a couple ways I look at that. So for example, if someone's urine specific gravity is low, that's a sign that they may be demineralized. I look at their, their fluid balance. It's funny. The old recommendation to people is eight, eight ounce glasses of water a day. The reality is I see people doing well on anywhere from one to three ounces per inch of height. And I dose it based on height and you'll find people who are way under that. You'll find people who are over that. Yeah. I can see you doing the math over there. Mm -hmm. So it's somewhere between like 60, 70 ounces for the average person and something like 200 or 210 for somebody who's fairly tall. And that obviously depends on what your, your sweat losses are. So. Yeah. I would just add to that as far as like a precautionary caveat with the sauna, mm. with, the, with the sauna space sauna, you can turn the light bulbs down. You can mm. turn some of the switches off and reduce the, the stimulation on the body. You can also shorten your duration. So some people who have thermal regulatory symptoms, like people with autoimmune issues, uh, will typically start with less bulbs and less time and titrate up to a situation where they're losing a, a pound of water out. And that may take many, many months. So you can be safe and slow and steady and still, you know, obviously I'm not the healthcare practitioner, but introduce the sauna, you know, when you can. And just understand that it's a slow process. You know, you're especially you have the issue with detox reactions. So you have healing reactions or retracing that reactions where you're experiencing the symptoms of a toxin that you detox. And so we want to minimize those by doing things slowly and safely. And sometimes less is more, you know, the turtle kind of wins the race. And then and then also you absolutely are you losing minerals and salt when you do sauna. So I uh, personally take electrolytes to replace that and other things as well uh, in the What's diet. Too. I'm sorry. What's your favorite electrolyte combo for post or pre sauna? So right now I switched. Uh, I'm using this brand called Peak that mm. has a, a really nice electrolyte that has ceramides and hyaluronic acid in it as well. And it's not too salty. Mm. So I, re I really like that one the best. And then um, I take a uh, I don't do this all the time, but sometimes I use uh, Chris Shades, uh, Dr. Shades, Quicksilver Scientific push catch binder approach. So he has the liver sauce, kidney care that you take to promote detox. And then you hit the sauna. And then 
afterwards you take his uh, charcoal silica binder. And I think it's important to mention that too. It's very helpful to take a binder after the sauna session to facilitate the body's elimination of toxins. And, and there's a lot of different binders you can take. That's just my preferred one. Do you hear that from people consistently? Hear what exactly? Uh, that they, they feel better when they use the binder after sauna. Uh, some people, yeah. Some people do swear by it religiously. Um, I don't know how, I don't have a numbers on like how consistently people do that, but I imagine a lot of people, less people do it than more, but I've found a uh, benefit to using it personally. Um, right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really very anecdotal. My experience with, and I've heard more than one person say that. Um, and it's part part of why I ask is that I think a lot of people, I think they get stuck in thinking if I'm not doing it perfectly, I might as well not even play or show yeah. up. And yeah. I think, you know, let's just make this as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's why I asked you about your electrolyte regimen. Do you have like a standard go to, okay, I'm going to sauna and then, and is it part of your daily routine? And then if it is, what's your pre and post sauna routine? Yeah, I, 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 I'm sauna in the morning. So I like to start my day with that early. So I'm not doing anything before unless I might take the, the liver sauce if I wanted to, but I'm taking the binder afterward and then uh, an electrolyte glass of water afterwards. And I also take more electrolytes if I need to, depending on what I do in the day. Say if I'm doing a PEMF therapy of some kind or some other thing that would advocate the drinking of more water. Um, and I do drink more water, Leland, than I used to. I used to not drink as much. I find I benefit more. You said 60 to 70. I, I'm probably, yeah, maybe even north of that. I love right that you're now. thinking about it now. Yeah. I love that you're thinking about it. We have a, a form at, at the practice that I, I created a series of forms because I needed my health coaches to be able to get data from people without me having to sit there and interview them. And then me be able to review it because I wasn't, you know, a lot of it's just standard stock questions that I ask people and the hydration and libation survey is where I, I realized I needed that question. And so I know exactly what people are drinking and I know, you know, how much and I know when and it really makes my job a lot easier. Okay. We show people those in our annual plans. If people want to know more about those, they're in my link tree. Uh, we help people fine tune their health. We do group coaching. Group coaching is where I do a lot of my talking about sauna, by the way, Brian, where, you know, people are coming on, they have questions about this, that, and the other thing they want to you know, improve this and that and whatever. And so sauna is something that I cover with pretty much everybody because they all need to hear about it um, for the exactly the reasons we've been chatting about. So um, Dr. B. Good asks, uh, she's curious how the infrared works uh, within, um, this is an interesting question. So it's yeah, it, it is, I can see it. Um, so I wanted to clarify this. So this is the photon. Yeah. This is the the bowl that powers our sauna, the technology that powers our sauna uh -huh. is a very large 250 watt incandescent heat lamp. So if you don't have this in your sauna, it's not a sauna space sauna. If you're talking about a bag sauna, it's most likely a farm infrared uh, emitter sauna that, that has little farm infrared heating elements inside of it. And it's usually the, the kind that you describe where your head sticks out of it. So that's, if it's a sauna space sauna, I don't know if you can bring it up on the website, but our saunas come, uh, it looks more like a, you know, a fortune teller's tent or something. It's a, or like a Bedouin tent. I consider doing this interview from my sauna space. Jim, Jim prevailed upon me to not do that. But anyway, uh, yeah. So I think what's important about what you just said, did you say it was, they're mostly far infrared? Yeah. Most of the saunas on the market, uh, are using far infrared tubular uh, ceramic emitters, or they're using farm for red carbon elements and they're all farm for red. So farm for red. Oh, I'm great. You brought, you brought it up. So 3000 and greater nanometers of the very low energy in infrared It's called FIR farm for red. And you see how there's not much in the sauna space bulb. If you scroll up to the, the sun spectrum, you'll see there's even less in the sun spectrum. There's like, mm -hmm. like less than 3% is in the sun spectrum. So we don't have much experience with farm for red light ancestrally and farm for it doesn't have deep tissue penetration because of water's absorption. So water absorbs light differently. According to the wavelength, the water absorption spectrum starts at 980 nanometers. I have that somewhere on my website elsewhere, but essentially 
near infrared light is not well absorbed by water, which is the primary chromophore in our body. So near infrared light therefore penetrates the deepest of all infrareds. I, I don't know where it is, Leland. It might be, I don't know if it's somewhere on there, but suffice it to say, you can look it up online. And, and so, so, uh, water, so, uh, there's an optical window to the human body and in the ultraviolet in the blue, in the visible light spectrum, it's melanin and hemoglobin mm -hmm. and, and their absorption reduces as you get into red near infrared and, and then water absorption begins at 980 nanometers. So from about 600 nanometers to 1200 nanometers. You have the optical window of the human body, the wavelengths that penetrate the deepest. And the deepest of those is near infrared at like 930 nanometers. So the near infrared light from the sun, the majority of the sun's emission, the majority of our experience, it's penetrating the deepest. It's heating you up radiantly. Far infrared saunas, which power most of the saunas on the market, are, are probably the least efficient infrared wavelength to use to heat the body. They're much better to heat the air. And they work great. Uh, for like outdoor patios when you're trying to heat the air with a farm for a minute and they're energy efficient. But if we're looking at heating of biological tissue, it's near infrared that, that works better. So it's a misunderstanding in the, in the market, but, um, far infrared is heating the body, but just not very efficiently. And yet it still, uh, is, you know, a product, the predominant product out there and, and the technologies are really different. So, for that, the, the doctor who asked the question, you can tell if it's a sauna space, it's got a big, huge red incandescent bulb in it. They're very distinctive. I like the design. Thank um, you. but it's very important what Brian just said to really unpack that and make sure people understand it. So it's not about heating your body. If it was just about heating your body, I could just, you know, I could, you know, just tell you all to drink a lot of tea and keep your thermostat on really high and a lot of other things that would heat your body. Mm -hmm. In fact, paradoxically, many of the frequencies that we use to most improve cellular bioenergetics are not actually, as Brian was saying, the best frequencies for heating the body. And this really is very um, counterintuitive for people because your, your natural tendency, you know, for whatever reason is basically the more intense the experience, the better it must be for me. So a great counter example of this would be, you know, I have a uh, EMR tech inferno or rather firestorm right here. And this is a red light therapy lamp that isn't hot. It's very bright, but it doesn't heat my body. But the energies in that are optimized to the human cell. And so people need to realize it's not just about heat. It's about the frequency. And so when I am vetting products and testing them, I actually get my, my meters out and I look at the actual frequencies that I'm seeing in the product to determine whether or not it's actually the, the stated frequency. And I can't stress how important that is because it's not, it doesn't just come down to, am I sweating? It's also, is this frequency charging my cellular battery so that it will do what it's supposed to do, whether or not that's activating my sweat glands. And that actually uh, is a good segue into this comment or question. So Sharon asks, uh, my head does sweat in the blanket. So again, Sharon, the point is actually more so that you're getting the light on your head because the light penetrating through the skull into the brain, most people are not aware that the brain is set up to funnel infrared light into its deepest uh, corners. Do you know that paper? where they talk about that. I think it's called melatonin and the optics of the human body. Yes. Yes. A fantastic. It's so it's the really the, good paper. Yeah. The near infrared light is not just stimulating mitochondrial response, light therapy. Mm -hmm. It also uh, provokes cellular melatonin production. Actually, like I think it's like 94% of the body's melatonin is produced cellularly, not by the pineal gland. And it's, it's meant to be produced right there next to the mitochondrial membrane where all the free radicals are being produced through energy production. And so the sun's light with, with mostly near infrared penetrate into the skull, getting into the deep brain tissue and the deep organs of the body is, is refilling the body's cellular antioxidant reserves. Melatonin's like the number one antioxidant. Uh, and you're not doing that to your brain if you're using red light, by the way, it needs to be near infrared so that that penetration through bone is only with near infrared, which the skull is our thickest bone. And this again is why I want my sauna to encase my entire body rather than just be a blanket. 
I would also say real quick to Sharon, mm -hmm. again, if you sweat out a pound of water and you raise core temperature to three degrees, you're technically achieving the desired outcome of a sauna session. And you can do that in a, in a sauna blanket. Uh, it'll just, you know, maybe take longer and maybe some disadvantages based on what you said, Leland, in terms of experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, one of the things I find interesting with the sauna space is that the obvious, uh, the obvious products you have on your, on your website, uh, it's a little cramped for two people. It's perfect for one, but you do have options for people to create a sauna using your, your bulbs. What do you recommend to people when they're looking to create a, a one to two or, or three to four person sauna? Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you brought it up. So you can buy our tungsten sauna panel on its own. We have three and four bulb versions. Essentially, you want the air to be just to be able to maintain an air temperature of just above body temperature. And that way the air doesn't cool you down. So instead of just using the tungsten panel inside your living room, you're enclosing some kind of space where the air can be kept hot enough to not cool you down. So if it can, it can maintain 100 degrees, then it's going to be an amazing do it yourself sauna space. And the larger the volume, the more panels you need. With our product, the, the four and the three together are under 15 amps. They'll work together on one 15 amp circuit and two four bowl panels require one 20 amp circuit. So if you had two four bowl panels, a total of eight bulbs, you could power uh, a sauna for like three or four people if the, if the height was low. Yeah. So here's the product right here. So, mm -hmm. so you can purchase this on, on its own and, and a lot of people uh, do that who want a custom built in sauna in their home or if legally if they already have a farm for its sauna, they already have that cabinet and they're like, darn, I wish I could sweat faster. I wish this would work better. They can buy just this and literally set it on the bench inside and, and plug it in and use this as the replacement heater and then add in their stack in their light therapy as well. One of the other really clever things that you did that I really appreciate is this idea of a sauna shower conversion kit, uh, because it's an obvious place to put a, a sauna. Um, obviously don't use the shower while you're saunaing. Um, but it makes a super simple conversion rather than having to build out a whole new room in your house. And you can do that. It looks like, I mean, or I would think anyway, with anything from like a closet to a, a shower to a spare bedroom. Yeah, absolutely. So a spare bedroom would be a little big. A spare bedroom is going to be a little big, but yeah, a little, a little closet. A lot of people are doing that. Um, um, really any small closet space you can, you can buy our tungsten pedestal that the, that the panel will sit on and our stool as well. If you want to go a little more uh, full sauna space, or you mm -hmm. can buy just the panel and it can hang on the wall by its hook and you can sit on any chair if you're choosing. And the key is to sort of drop the ceiling or make the volume of the area small enough that the, the, the sauna space panel itself is enough to keep the air warm as it's heating the body. So Kathleen asks, uh, can you use infrared bulbs in a wooden box infrared sauna? And the answer is yes. Just as we really have just literally been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what's the name of that electrolytes solution that you use, by the way? It's the peak brand P I Q U E. Oh, I would have thought P E A K, but anyway, all right. I think we've got, all right. This is another good question. How often should we sauna? So my answer to that is I start people at, you know, 10 to 20 minutes, three times a week. And then if they tolerate that and feel better, we'll go up in intensity and duration. Uh, and sometimes, you know, I am limited on one of those, you know, they can't spend them enough time or they have to do longer sessions, fewer times a week. Yeah. That's generally where I start people. Do you have a standard recommendation that you make? Well, we should mention the, the, like the Lau Cannon study was the main 20 year sauna study following 2000 finished males published in 2015. And in that we saw an interesting conclusion. So the guys that did sauna one day a week versus those that didn't do sauna had like 30 to 50% reduced all cause mortality. And they were looking at heart disease and heart attacks. But what was interesting was that the guys that did sauna a few days a week versus the guys that did sauna one day a week had an additional like 30 or more percent reduction in all cause mortality. So the conclusion 
was that at least even doing sauna one day a week will have a big impact on your health span and your and your health in general. But ideally, uh, it's going to be better to do it as you recommended, Leland, three times a week. And what's really cool about that study is they published a follow up six years later. It was like 2021, I believe, where they looked at dementia outcomes. And guess what? They found out the same thing. One day of sauna a week reduces your your risk of dementia dramatically. And then if you're doing sauna three days a week, you have even uh, a proportionally increase or excuse me, decreased risk of dementia. So the more sauna is better, but balancing that with not doing too much, I would say seven days a week is too much. Uh, you know, um, Why? I think it's well, I think it's the mineral loss and the electrolyte loss, I would say I, there are there are some sauna cancer protocols where they're doing two saunas a day. Now that's and, a whole other kettle of fish. Yeah. And, and, you know, maybe that's something we don't talk about, but I know there's, <laughs> I know there, there's like, yeah. uh, there's hope for cure and there's a couple different, uh, Baja based medical clinics where they're in that, uh, Mexico. Yeah. In Mexico. Yeah. Their, we, their protocol is, is twice a day for, for a certain number of weeks. Well, I'm glad you mentioned it because it's one of the things that I, one of the reasons why I love sauna therapy is that if you look at the literature, you'll, because Brian just mentioned this it, obliquely, albeit that it reduces your risk of death, right? Well, one of the top, one of the top causes of death, I think it's number two now behind heart disease, but I would say it's catching up pretty quickly is cancer. And we know from the literature that the more fevers you have over a certain period of time, the lower your risk of many cancers like melanoma. And we first understood this, uh, this affiliation or rather association when there were some case reports in the early 1900s of patients whose severe metastatic cancers resolved after a febrile illness, which really surprised their doctors. This actually prompted physicians to isolate the bacterial cell wall, com wall components that induce a fever. I believe it's endotoxin and lipopolysaccharides. And they would then, uh, having isolated these from the bacteria, they would actually inject them into cancer patients. This oh, was known as Collie's toxin. It was legal and used widely in the United States up through, I think, the middle of the 20th century. Don't quote me on that. The longer story on that is in Tom Cowan's book, um, which I'm not going to say the title of for fear of getting uh, smacked by the censorship stick. Um, but it's his, his book on the changing face of childhood illness. And that gives you enough information to Google it and find the answer. So sauna is like a mini fever. And it was even the ancient Greeks noticed, noted this. I think it was Parmenides who said, give me a drug that will produce a fever and I will cure any disease, mm -hmm. which is really a very over the top promise. It's not quite that simple. But I also want to point out one of the things that we see a lot of today is autoimmunity and allergic disease. And one of the things you'll see is number one, those diseases have gone up massively in prevalence and severity since we removed ourselves from the near infrared rich sunlight that is supposed to fine tune your immune system and vitamin D is another part of that story. It's one reason why I have a vitamin D lamp in the background. I use that just about every day and I just retested my vitamin D levels. They were 47 uh, because I'm kind of inconsistent on this. And even though I live in Florida and get maybe an hour or two of of, uh, of intense UV light at least, at least several times a week. Um, but my hope is that long-term and my belief is that long-term use of sauna will actually mitigate risk of, of cancer among other illnesses. Although I don't think anyone studied that specifically. And then I'll throw in autoimmune and allergy, um, as well because of how it affects cellular uh, bioenergetics and helps you eliminate the toxins that are then associated with all of those illnesses. So, um, anything else you want to talk about today or add quickly before I close this out? Uh, if we just talk about the mitochondria, I think a little, a little bit, these, mm. these batteries in the cells. So when we do light therapy, and it has a lot of different names, most people are more familiar with uh, red light therapy that's LED based, like the panel behind you. So that is not just for the skin, it's for every cell of the body. Every cell of the body except red blood cells has mitochondria in it. And the definition of light therapy is the use of red and near infrared light to heal damaged and degenerate cells and to re-optimize function or improve optimize function of healthy cells. So 
the way it's, you know, there's many ways that it's doing it. Some of it's, help, you know, producing melatonin, but uh, in, in terms of photobiomodulation and light therapy, we're, we're activating the mitochondria, which is not just a uh, battery. It's not just an energy producer. It's really a cellular actor. You know, it has its own DNA. It has its own systems. When we stimulate it with near infrared light, it goes to work repairing the cell and fixing everything around it. It, it promotes inflammation reduction and regenerative effects. There's also immune modulation effects because of the nitric oxide release out of the cell. It's another immune agent. And overall, uh, it increases blood circulation and tissue oxygenation. So uh, beyond all of those things, and those are the reasons why red light therapy in general and, and near for light therapy is, is going more into the mainstream now, is that it actually improves the function of the mitochondria itself. And that's important, I think, in the previous um topic we just talked about you know like the is it the beard theory leland, leland of of cancer where or uh, i think where basically in the cancerous cell the mitochondria are broken and they're stuck in fermentation you're and talking so, about the warburg hypothesis the warburg the warburg excuse me you're right yes the warburg effect so right. uh, there's certainly uh there's certainly something interesting in about how the mitochondria is a marker for health and and good functioning mitochondria um you know leads to i think the prevention of disease and also amelioration of disease in general is getting those mitochondria to work better and so i just wanted to emphasize that that the light therapy is not just fixing the cell it's fixing the most important part of your cell arguably maybe beside the nucleus is this thing that produces energy and this built-in cellular actor that constantly can repair everything in all the cells of the body. When we look at the body as this uh, collection of cells, you know, we fix from the ground up, we fix the cells, the tissues work better, the organs work better, and then the body works better. We, we actually get whole holistic effects from, you know, fixing that foundation and the mitochondria are really at the center of it. Absolutely. I agree with everything you just said. Most of what I focus on in helping people you know, in my medical practice and then in my coaching practice directly or indirectly affects mitochondrial health. And I don't, I don't talk about mitochondria as much as a lot of uh, people are today, but you know, there's something that I spent years looking at and studying. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's the, what, what I find most important and what I'm most focused on and what I talk about is how are we actually going to, you know, get the patient or the you know, client, if it's a coaching program, the result that they want and getting them to actually engage with the therapy is what really matters, whether or not they understand all the subcellular uh, biomechanics. Although I do find the subcellular biomechanics fascinating and mitochondria, they, you know, they do on, they do emit red and infrared light. If you look at the byproducts of our met metabolic, um, uh, the metabolic pathways we depend upon most glycolysis to break down glucose and then beta oxidation and the Krebs cycle in the mitochondria, they're releasing red and infrared light. And that's why we are warm blooded. We're warm blooded because our bodies are producing light. One of the things you'll see as people age is that their, their body temperature drops mm. and it's sort of a chicken or the egg process. Are they getting colder because they're uh, sicker or are they getting sicker because they're colder? And you know, the bottom line is you got to nourish them properly. And then you and that doesn't just mean the food that they're eating. It means the light that their body is taking in because we've never lived in a world where we didn't have an abundance of red and infrared light, even when we've moved out of the tropics, um, as a, as a species, we've brought the light with us with fire. And as you mentioned, just at the beginning, we've created, uh, traditions of sauna and sweat lodge and other things like that. Yeah. So. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you certainly, if we step out of the weeds of all that for a second, and I find it's refreshingly, I think it's encouraging and refreshingly simple that you can sit on your lazy butt in a sauna and not really do anything and yet accomplish so much for your well, life. I have to tell you that on that, on that note, it is one of the most uh, simple and restful practices I now have in my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't, I, I totally underestimated how much I would enjoy it. I thought it was going to be another thing I was going to have to do for my health. And now I, 
am always looking forward to it and trying to squeeze it into my day, even when there's other things I should be doing. Um, and I really think that people will, you know, I think a lot of people look at this, the, the price tag on a sauna and they think, well, you know, I could do this and I could do that and I could buy this and I could buy that. But I look at what people spend their money on in general. And I think you're much, much better off going ahead and putting the money into the sauna than you are putting it into any of the other things that uh, people often, often buy. If it's pound for pound, probably the best, some of the best money you could spend on your health and well-being. And I'm trying to find things that really compete with it, particularly long-term because, you know, your saunas are very robust. They're not going to break down. And I, what's your, what's the, the length or, or lifespan on the bulb? The bulbs last 5,000 hours. So it's many years of use. How many years? Well, if we look at the, some people use the photon therapy light, which I was showing here. You know, if you, if you use mm -hmm. that 10 hours a day or whatever, that'd be a couple years of use maybe, but the saunas, their sauna sessions only usually a half an hour. Uh, it's less mm -hmm. than an hour. So right. we're talking so guess, a decade. I guess you know. it's 10,000 sessions. If it's 30 minutes and it's 5,000 hours, right? Correct. That's, that's okay. That's a lot. That's a lot. That would be about, if it's, there's 365 days and let's say 330 days of sauna. Um, that's three years. If you sauna almost every single day. Yeah. And, and I, I, again, most people don't have the time for that. I, um, but you You're telling me it's also, it's comforting Leland that you can replace the bulbs too after yes, years true. and years of use it's and, true, and everything else still works and stays the same. That's right. Okay. So um, I'm just going to share uh, the screen and show people where they can um, let's find you. Do you want to tell everyone where they can find you, what the best place to look you up is? Yeah, on our website, sauna.space. We have everything there, all of our products. Uh, you can go to the learn section, learn about the spectra we talked about and and other types of science-y stuff. And you can see the real reviews. Sale going on. They have a phenomenal sale going on right now. Oh it's yeah, great. I think there's a July yeah. July sale going on right now. So yeah, all the product information's on there. It comes with a nice long trial period and free shipping in the U.S. and Canada. And uh, there's more content too. If you want to watch more content on our YouTube and our Instagram, and and Facebook and Twitter, we're at Sauna Space, and we have a lot of great stuff on there too that you can check us out on. But all, all the heart of everything is in Sauna Space, and we have we're completely vertically integrated in house. So if you want to talk to someone at Sauna Space, uh, you can call us at the contact number in the footer and. A real human being will answer you. A real life human being. Uh, a real life human being in the United States, even. Correct. <laughs> right wow. here. I'm right here at the store. And my uh, affiliate discount code is Stillman5. Uh, so use that to get an extra discount. I want to let people know that I've got a webinar coming up at the end of the month with Clark Engelbert. We're going to be talking about mineral balancing. It's going to be very germane to the topic of sauna and detoxification because if you don't keep your minerals balanced, you're not going to feel well. And keeping your minerals balanced when you sauna is critical, as we've talked about today. Um, I actually just put out a video yesterday on heavy metal toxicity, where I get into a little bit more of how I use the sauna space in these cases and why it's important to use sauna, as well as other aspects of heavy metal toxicity. That's over at my Substack. All of this is in my link tree for the record. And then I coach people how to use sauna to get well in my annual plans and my practice. Again, that's in my link tree. And Jim and I coach people into this in our coaching programs. The annual programs at my practice are available in New York and Florida. Uh, but my uh, coaching practice, we coach people all over the world. And you can find out the five big, biggest health mistakes, which actually have not really got anything to do with, well, they indirectly have to do with sauna, but sa not saunaing is not one of our five biggest health mistakes. Um, but sign up for that and you can find out more about that program. So thanks everyone for watching. Brian, thank you for joining me. Any closing thoughts? Oh, thank you for having me, Leland. Yeah, I, I, I guess my closing thought is, is it was kind of what we started with, and that's the feeling. You know, I, I don't like doing things for my health just because they're therapeutic. I like to do things that are fun and feel good. And that's a, the difference you get with the sauna space, sauna and the sauna space experience is it, it really feels good in there. It really feels like you're doing something happy and healthy for your body. It's not just another chore to do for your health. It's It has so many benefits, including engaging in some some stillness and some mindfulness on top of the the detox and and the grounding therapy and all these other things that uh you'll be blown away and if you're 
uh, maybe dissuaded from the use of sauna due to it not being a fun experience, you should try it again the sauna space way. I absolutely agree. I've used lots of different saunas. This is the only one I use and recommend now. Thank you. All right. Great. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Have a great day. Go get in your sauna. Get some heat.